All right, everybody, here we are, Road to Paris, and we are with Beth Potter, who undoubtedly is one of the favorites going into Paris Olympics 2024 to win a medal in um, in the triathlon. Amazing person, incredible story. Beth, welcome to Road to Paris. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, I know it's a it's a busy time of year, and I really appreciate you taking time. You know, one of the one of the reasons that I wanted to do this interview is that you know, there's a lot of big races throughout the year with World Triathlon, with Ironman, with with T100. But there's going to be more eyes on the triathlon in Paris in that in that one day that you're racing than basically the other four years combined. So I really wanted to put something together so that people could understand who Beth Potter is. <laughs> well, a little bit about me. I have come from a triathlon field background. Um, so I competed at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games in the 10K. Unfortunately, had a bit of a stomach bug uh, the night before the race, so didn't actually perform um, as well as I should have. And yeah, I think really off the back of the Games in, in Rio um, and being so disappointed after that, um, that whole championship, so decided that I needed to do something different and throw myself into something completely different out of my comfort zone and... Yeah, here we are, um, nearly eight, eight years later in different sport and um, going for a medal at Paris in the triathlon. What, what was the intrigue about triathlon for you? Say that again, sorry. What was the... What was the intrigue? What What was the spark that said, oh. hey, that's what I want to do? Um, I think uh, I obviously actually got into running um, and, you know, got success in running quite quickly because I had a swim background mm -hmm. and I loved swimming. I used to do swimming um, every night of the of the week uh, when I was younger and when I was growing up and I used to swim before school. I just loved it. I wasn't like amazing at it. Like I was, you know, I'd reached the finals um, at national level, but I, I was not really winning things, but I just really enjoyed it. I had a, a good group of friends at, at the swim club and just really had fun there. And I think the intrigue yeah, for me was, I could obviously run and I really enjoyed running and I was like, well, you know, I'd spent quite a few summers injured uh, and had to train a bit on the walk bike. Um, so I had no like real experience of in a group riding or, you know, kind of any sort of racing on the bike, but I'd used it for fitness and rehab coming back from injuries. So yeah, I just thought, well, out of the three sports, it's probably the easiest to pick up. Um, and obviously coming into the sport as an adult, um, you know, I, I had the technique from the swim and, and the run and being able to kind of pick up the biking. I just thought it's, it's going to be tough, but it's probably the easiest out of the three to try. And and I think all, all along, um, like as I was growing up, everyone, you know, at the running club and at the swimming club always said, oh, you should try triathlon. Like you can swim and bike, swim, swim and run, sorry. And um, mm. you just have to master the bike. So I think, yeah, it was there was always like um, that bit that I wanted to kind of, I was interested to see how good I could be or if I could even do it. So, yeah, um, decided to move up to Leeds and train with the squad here. And, yeah, I, I think it's one of the best decisions I've ever made. <laughs> so you've actually been training for triathlon for a long time, even though you didn't know it. Well, I, I would actually go to the swimming pool because I spent a lot of my... I studied at Loughborough University and I spent mm -hmm. probably the four... Uh, out of the four years I was at Loughborough, probably three and a half of those years I was injured. So... I actually did a little bit of swimming with the triathlon squad and then I um, I found that my time was more efficient if I did aqua jogging. So I spent actually quite a lot of time in the water at Loughborough uh, and not running, just pool running. So um, yeah, I hadn't really ever done more than three or four weeks of walk bike sessions um, really. But yeah, I think uh, it has taken has taken time, you know, it's not, um, it's not been quick or smooth. Hmm. How old were you when you started actually really training focused after after Rio? And um, so I was 24 years old when I went to the Rio Olympics hmm. and I moved up to Leeds just after my 25th birthday. Hmm. Um, and yeah, I think I just kind of threw myself. I was thrown in at the deep end, very much deep end. And yeah, um, I think it did take a while for me to kind of adjust to the training. It was difficult and um, I was tired a lot of the time and um, just couldn't really keep up or couldn't do any of the training for a couple of years, really. 
um, and then yeah got to grips with it probably like 2019 so it probably took me two years to probably get um get to grips with the training load hmm. well that's that's a good age I started triathlon when I was 24 and you know a lot of people looked at the 24 at that time is like old and ancient but I felt like a kid that was just starting over again because I was I was a swimmer also um what, what's been the biggest difference for you as far as training just for running compared to have you had to adjust things maybe even your mindset when it comes to putting three sports together I find that um well there's a, the, the training volume is a lot higher so I would run um, you know you can do your training in about an hour an hour and a half really when you when you're just running um and you know I, I was able to hold down a, a full-time job with that as well mm. um and I guess with a, with triathlon like I, I, I need to spend time on the bike I need to spend time in the pool and then the running on top of that so yeah being able to kind of have a job as a professional is difficult um, and I, I don't have time time for that because if I'm not training I'm eating or if I'm not eating I'm sleeping you know <laughs> so it's uh, yeah it's it that is my full-time job now and I guess in terms of training load um I found you know a lot of the stuff I do in triathlon is um just a lot easier like so there's a lot of kind of more polarized training mm. uh, a big part of that training in the week is just you know easy miles easy aerobic miles whereas when I used to run I used to do a lot of um <laughs> sorry a lot of kind of I, I, I didn't run that much I would run kind of uh hard and fast for a lot of it so I would just go out and smash it for uh half an hour sort of thing and then you know like I wouldn't really do I wasn't a believer of kind of easier training uh, I would just do everything quite hard mm. yeah when I first when I, I was like that also when I first started I ran hard all the time so I thought how am I going to get fast if I don't run fast and then I I saw that that's not the formula for triathlon and I I spoke to individual sport coaches and could see that if I did everything they wanted me to do for each of the individual sports, I was going to kill myself. So I realized this is a different kind of sport. It's not swimming, cycling, and running. It's triathlon and with three disciplines. And so there really was that adaptation process. You you moved to Leeds and and you tapped into some pretty pretty experienced triathletes there. What what's some of the advice that um, Alistair has given you? Um, well, I've always been quite consistent in my training. Like I love training. I don't like missing training, but I think one of the biggest takeaways from Alistair is, you know, just turning up and getting it done, no matter like how you feel. And I, I remember last year uh, in January, I had this awful, I think I was coming off the back of like a flu. Mm -hmm. And I just was getting like a couple of illnesses as well, like throughout the kind of winter period. And I just couldn't seem to get, it just wasn't clicking for me. It mm. like training just felt like a struggle mentally, physically. I just, I just found it really tough. And um, he just kept telling me, just, just get the session done. Don't like, don't, don't get out early. Just get the session done. Doesn't matter what times you're you're swimming or you're you know what what's you're pushing on the bike. Just get it done, and it will come good. And it did come good. And you know like all those um kind of sessions where I felt awful, but it was a really good character test because. Uh, you're not going to feel amazing in races all the time and it's it's mm. good to kind of get through those um harder times when yeah it just kind of tough toughens you up mentally as well so it sounds like it was more talking about Consist consistency more than anything yeah no for sure yeah so i think yeah that's uh yeah definitely one of the things i really try and do week in week out and um i think the reason i've seen such big improvements you know year from year is just because I've been able to kind of stack those sessions like week on week and every month and the years have accumulated and you know I've just got my gains through that you know a lot of people might look at that and they go geez you, you've had to give up so much of your life to to, to pursue this but I, I don't know if about you personally but I always feel like you know in athletics when this is something you want to do you're not sacrificing anything this is like mm -hmm. the coolest thing you could possibly think of doing yeah I've never really seen it as a sacrifice because you know there are things that I have to miss like you know I'm, I've missed lots of friends weddings and you know like important kind of life life things but I've, I'm really lucky that I've got a very supportive network of people around me who understand and you know I do try my best to be there like be there for them as well in other ways so 
um yeah like I I don't see it as a sacrifice I love doing it I've always loved training like it's I, I love training more than I love racing probably so I don't see see it as a sacrifice because yeah it's something that I enjoy doing and I want to do it so you know it would be a sacrifice if I didn't want to do it but mm-hmm. um I like being here and I like I like doing it and yeah it's yeah fun. I'm right there with you. I love the training. I did the racing because that's how I kind of could justify it. But the training was always so fun to just see if you could get that little bit faster, that little little bit more efficient. You know, just that, like like what when it's clicking for you, what does that that feel like? What's that magic moment where you're in a workout and you go, "This is this is what it feels like when I'm really on it." I, I've got I've got it at the moment and on the run. It just feels really good. But um, yeah, it just it just feels easy and you just feel like you're in this state of flow and yeah it's just difficult to eat. I mean it doesn't never last for that long so you just, you want to kind of hold on to that and just remember but um yeah it's just it's just good to be like being being able to tick off the sessions and feeling good and recovering off the back of them and yeah I, I also find when I'm in that kind of like feel like really fit and going well that everything just goes so quickly like the the four hour ride just feels like an hour and a half. It just goes. It's just quick, and uh, you don't even think about it. It's just done. So, yeah, I guess there's some sort of kind of feeling of like being able to flow and just enjoying it, and the time passing quickly. Mm, kind of that that timelessness where time is elastic. Sometimes you know when it's not going well, it's completely oh, opposite. It's the opposite. You can <laughs> you notice everything, every pain. And you're just counting it, like counting the seconds on the on the clock. Yeah, so it's the complete opposite of that. So that's yeah. good. Yeah, like how many more hundreds do we have? You know that kind of. Yeah, thing. yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, let let's fast forward a little bit. Kind of actually, go going back to um, Paris last summer. What an what an amazing experience there for you. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was like a triathlon I've never done before. I think the whole, um, you know, the whole build up to the actual race was really different to anything I've ever experienced. It was, it felt a lot, like a lot higher pressure. It was just, it was, it felt like an Olympic Games. Um, and you could tell everyone was a little bit on tender hooks. And um, I certainly was, I was, didn't sleep much going into that race and just felt very nervous and it was just felt like I'd never done a triathlon before it was all new again and I was you know just alien but yeah I think I coped with the pressure well you know I went on number one and yeah finished number one and um yeah there was just it was just different like a different kind of uh like with the pontoon that you know everyone usually goes to one side you know we, we chose to go bang in the middle of the pontoon it was all just a bit different and um it was a good opportunity to be able to kind of go there and race race on the course and get you know all the information that you we need and we want for this year so it was a good fact finding experiment as well and yeah i'm looking forward to, to going back there on, on the 31st of july <laughs> were there any parallels between how you felt in rio compared to how how that race felt going into it um i think yeah well i, I was going there you know to, to get a medal last year and I was going there as probably not the favorite but one of the favorites and and mm. um, you know going to Rio I was going there for a top 12 you know that would have been really good for me and so it's mm. like a sort of different um different feel about it as well you know like a different sort of pressure and target um uh, and yeah it was yeah it was just everything that everything and more that I I dreamt of really it was it was great I loved it mm. yeah you know if you're going for top 12 there's at least 11 other people that you're thinking about when you're going for top of the podium there's a very small handful that in your mind those are actually the people that are filling in and you're watching yeah no exactly and I think um I probably went in there with like a bit of a uh well, expectation but also you know I probably had a lot of people um trying to get rid of me on either swim and bike or run even so you know like I was a bit of a, a target I guess so yeah, I think I, I coped with all that well. And it was really good to kind of have that experience last year going into the games this year and um yeah, just knowing what to expect, which is is really good as well. Do you like being the target? I don't mind. Um yeah, I, I really don't mind. I, I like just focus on myself and 
um, yeah, as long as I kind of tick off my own process goals and uh, and do those bits right, like I know that I'll have a good race. So not getting distracted by other people, and I've had to work. That's something I've had to work on quite a lot with my psychologist. And mm. um, yeah, I think I think I've got it kind of you know nailed, and um, yeah, still working with them and just yeah trying to reinforce those little bits that we really put into place well last year and, and taking that into the summer as well <clears throat> what are some of the things that have changed in you working with a sports psychologist to get you to that point what have you had to change modify figure out how to put in a box so that it doesn't distract you but you can use it almost like your superpower in a sense well i think like i've got everyone's got like a weak dog and a strong dog and i feel like the weak dog would just kind of read its ugly head every now and then so mm -hmm. like just being able to kind of silence that dog and just um mm -hmm. uh I I think I really I've always struggled with uh like that kind of deep belief in myself I've always kind of I don't know just like I, I'm good with it in training but then sometimes I found that when I was in a race like I would give people more credit than than I would give myself and mm -hmm. I yeah I've really had to work on that and you know, just a lot of kind of self-talk and um, like a, almost a little bit of a running commentary in my head when I'm in a race and just reinforcing positive thoughts and, and staying calm when the, the pressure points really start to to hit, I guess. Um, and that, that helps because you don't want to make silly mistakes and and um, staying calm under pressure is, is, you know, how you're going to get yourself out of maybe sticky situations or, you know, just get yourself back in the race. And I've, I've definitely had um you know my fair share of bad races mm. and like even last year you know where I've had terrible swims because I was struggling with a shoulder problem and just trying to stay calm when I come out the swim and be like right okay on to the next on to the next bit because mm. you can do the next bit really well to get yourself back in the race and mm. yeah I did that last year at quite a few races and um I think that just staying calm and cool and making good decisions is is really key for that you know that this type of racing that we're doing Mm. that's that's such a great quality to be able to go okay swim's done I'm not in the lead pack but the race is not over yet yeah and you just have to think I find saying like things like don't panic that's quite negative because it's don't which is negative and panic right. just even the word panic makes you panic so I try and say things like like stay relaxed fine um you know like what's next I've got transition so I can run I'm good at transitions because I'm quick at them and I can run so this is what I need to do, bang, bang, bang. And then bike, first part of the bike, you know, just like get get yourself back in the race. And also like trying to motivate other riders around you as well. I find that quite useful because everyone is motivated to get to the front pack. And if you can maybe not shout at them, but like, you know, be positive and encourage them that, you know, like this is going to work for all of us here. If we can get to the front pack, you know, you can then get involved and you might get a podium out of this, you know, so it's, it's just about kind of encouraging others around you as well and getting people to work with you. So hmm. um, I found that's been pretty helpful as well. Yeah, in, in the test event, you were not in that lead group, but you caught back up to it on the bike. Was Were you were you getting the, all the other women like, come on, we got to do this? Or was there much conversation in the pack then? Um, I actually, I, I think I came out the water 35 seconds down, but I had a really good transition. And when I got to my bike, I could see the group just mounting their bikes and I was like oh we're, we can see them that's fine and yeah there was a core group of four of us I think um Katie Zafiras, Nina Ayn and Jamla here and we just got there was like a whole load of us sitting on our on our wheels and we just yeah I just was like come on let's just work we, we can see them there and you could see I could see the girls in front looking behind and I knew that they knew that we were coming and I didn't feel at any point that I wasn't going to get there like even mm. if it took me to seven flat I always felt like I'd get there but um yeah I, I like that's how much I've come along in a short space of time like I didn't panic you know I was like it's fine we'll we'll get there whether it's one lap two lap or eight laps we'll be there by the end of the bike so um yeah wow and, and you know Paris I, I find is such a it's such a unique place you know like I, when I was I was there for the event watching and no matter where I was if I took a photo on the course it looked iconic I mean talk mm -hmm. about just the just that setting to have the Olympics be in for triathlon yeah it's you know Paris is an amazing city um you know there's home of many 
um, you know, bike races. And I think it's really cool to be part of uh, that movement where we get to race on, on the same streets as the Tour de France riders. And um, yeah, it's just really exciting. And uh, yeah, the course goes around many of the iconic buildings and just yeah, getting to see them is really cool as well. Although we're not really looking at too many of them are focusing, but it's uh, even like the pictures from the podium has got the Eiffel Tower in the background. It's really cool. Um, yeah, no, it's it's an amazing city. Yeah, it's 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 going to be pretty amazing. I I am pretty sure the triathlon will be one of the events in this Olympics that everybody remembers. Like you said, you're you're riding where the Tour de France goes, and this year you guys get to go there. The Tour de France is finishing in Nice, so you're the only ones who are actually going to be riding on the Champs Elysees. Yeah, it's, and I, there's actually a really cool clip, and I'm I'm not sure on the kind of updated version of where the run course is going to be because there was talk of changing it. But there mm. was a really cool clip of um, me and Casson running up the um, running up towards the, sh the Arc de Triomphe, and it's just really cool. Like, mm. it, it's just really cool. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. You know, you, you talked about sort of dealing with stress and then getting your mind in that right space and finding the finding the right words that don't detract but add to what you're doing out there when you look back at this whole experience after Paris is over what are going to be some of the things that you look back and go why was I even worried about that um I, don't, I honestly don't know like I haven't thought past that day and I find that I find myself every day thinking about that day at the mm -hmm. moment like every single day I wake up and I just or you know like in a track session I'll just imagine that the people around me in the group are other athletes and in that, that I race and and like how do I get to the line first you know just mm. yeah I just find myself thinking about it and almost like thinking about other outcomes as well because um yeah I don't want to just prepare like like I prepare for a race I prepare for like A to Z um you know I want to prepare for any outcome as well like um you know like if it doesn't go to plan if you know how am I going to deal with that and um I just want to be prepared for everything cover all bases and I think looking back I just want to make sure that I've that I've done everything possible to you know to do the best I can and if it doesn't work on the day it doesn't it doesn't work like that's just part of my story but I just want to be able to stand on that start line on the 31st of July and just know that I threw everything at it um, and there's nothing more I could have done and it's just maybe not maybe not meant to be if that's mm -hmm. if that's the outcome but I just want to make sure I've got no regrets and that um yeah that I, that I can do anything everything to kind of put myself in the best position that's that's all you can do you know yeah. one, one of your earlier interviews that I saw you, you talked about resilience and patience being two really important qualities that that you need that you have that you that you work with talk about some of that about patience especially yeah um I think that's something I've struggled with like I don't know whether most people struggle with that but I've definitely struggled with that um, and just not wanting it all now like I've just for the past couple of years like I knew that I could do it but I've just wanted it now like right now um, and it's not going to happen like that. You have to kind of work away at it and you have to uh, you have to be patient because you have to kind of go through the process and that's part of the journey. And that's definitely something that I've had to, yeah, well, I say be patient with um, and like learn just to kind of let go and just let it happen uh, and learn along the way. And that's something that um, it, took, it took a while for me to kind of learn that. But once I kind of got to it, I probably did see the results start to come in um but yeah not something not my 40. <laughs> if it no, not. yeah I, you know I think all of us want things to happen quicker than they they do in, in the real world and you know being a great runner going to the Olympics in, in the 10,000 and then sort of having that humility to just say okay I'm going to start from ground zero here and then you know look at whatever six or seven years later you are you, you are probably the favorite in in Paris I think you've mastered patience yeah I mean I think good things take time they don't they don't happen overnight and um yeah it's just about doing it every day and doing it like training like a champion and eating like a champion and going to bed like a champion like doing all those things really well 
and that's what um that's what bill always tells me to do he says you know you have to do everything like a champion you have to turn up to training and even on your off days you've got to you know turn up with the right attitude and get it done mm. and um yeah i think i've just had to kind of chip away at all of those bits and and work it work at that and I'm I'm really fortunate that I've got such good role models at training as well to look up to. You know, from day one, I had um, I had the Brownleys, and you know that's more mot- more motivation than than you need to be honest, because you've got them right there, and they're going through the hard training as well. So it's it's yeah, motivation and in like in surplus just there. <laughs> oh, that's great. See, just seeing the um, the great things only come through that hard work and consistent work yeah no for sure and I think like when you surround yourself with people who are better than you hopefully that you can become you know like the same as them so I think that's also helped like success beats success and Mm. um there's there's loads of success in our group from you know short course all the way through to kind of middle distance and long course in in our training group and leads so it's it's really good to see and um yeah we all feed off that yeah, that you know, they say that uh, people who achieve those super high levels of mastery, they don't stay in the comfort zone. They they always go into that uncomfortable area. So you're training with people who are faster than you, and that elevates everything that you're doing. Yeah, no, for sure. And I that's part of the reason I do a lot of my training with um, with boys. You know, I I just think it's more straightforward for me anyway. Um, and it's yeah, they they constantly push me you know I've got a a big group of boys like across from bike and run that they can push me in in lots of different ways but not to say that I don't like training with girls like I've got um you know my sister's a runner she she paces me on the track and um I've got uh, my Swiss teammate or kind of yeah Swiss training partner uh Nora Gamur who's also doing really good things this year as well and it's really good to see you know that just by putting in a couple of consistent uh winters you can you can really get some good results. Hmm. You, you talked about sleep. Are you a great sleeper? Terrible. Ah. So bad. <laughs> so bad. Um, no, it's it, it was really bad before the pandemic. And then I think part part of the reason it got good was um I got a dog and oh. that that yeah really helps with anxiety and um just yeah, just someone to have around the house and um he's whining in the background there because he's ready for his evening walk but um yeah I think that's part that's helped a lot just with kind of the insomnia that I had out of season so I'd have like three or four weeks at a time I wouldn't get much sleep but yeah I I still struggle kind of in the lead up to races I try and kind of bank sleep when I'm at home and uh, and get like lots of sleep so that when I go away I know I'm not going to sleep well but I can be relaxed because I'm on taper week and I'm and I've got more energy and I've got I'm more relaxed kind of other than going to bed um but yeah it's, it's been a struggle um and I, I think it's only getting worse to be honest with you the older I get and the, the more mm. pressure on me going into races but yeah it's just part of who I am uh, I've let, had to learn to accept that and um I'm just finding ways to kind of deal with it and so far it's been okay um but yeah it's it is like quite difficult when you're lying in bed at like 3 a.m. wide awake the night before a race and you've got to get up in two hours. Um, but I think, I remember Alistair texted me before Paris last year and he said, it's it sleep's overrated. Like you've got the, you've got the kind of, um, you've had the rest, you've got the recovery, you've tapered, you're fresh. All you need to do is race. So sleep, any sleep is a bonus. Mm. So I think that's definitely helped me now with the last couple of races. Um, <clears throat> I, I was actually a pretty good sleeper until the night before the race and then it was like you know if I got two hours or three hours before the Ironman I was that that's all that was fine you know and I it was actually the most relieving thing when that alarm finally went off and I could just get out of bed go execute what I had practiced to to do yeah. thousands of times well that's the thing like your body's not going to forget how to do it like you've done it a hundred times you know how to do it like you yeah, and I always I always find the worst part, and this is what's this is what was so annoying about Abu Dhabi being cancelled a couple of weeks ago, was you know we'd gone through that whole like sleepless night and mm. feeling sick the next morning, not being able to eat your breakfast, and then the race was cancelled, and it's mm. like we did the worst part of it, 
like we had the worst part of the build up. Like once you actually get to race course, it's fine. It's the whole like at the hotel and milling around and in the hotel room. That is just the worst part. But once you're at the, the race course, you've got like a list of a hundred things that you need to do. You need to do check-in. I mean, it's, it's just way more relaxed, I always find. So um, the only positive, I'm trying to be positive here, is that we kind of went through the process. So yeah. even though we didn't race, we still had the kind of, we went through the whole process of it. So, um, but when that race was cancelled, I literally felt the adrenaline drain from out my body. And it was like, it was like a switch. It just all came pouring out. And I actually was really tired that night as if I'd raced. I had all the kind of after race feels, but I hadn't even raced. So yeah, yeah, that that had to be incredible when I when I saw the news come in that it had been canceled. I, I thought I was misreading something. Like it was canceled. They did not have the race. Yeah, and, and maybe to see maybe there's a big lesson there to see the impact of all of that buildup, what it has, and and maybe there's another way to sort of have that be less tense so that you have more energy <clears throat> when the when the gun actually does go off yeah I don't, I don't know it was just it was very frustrating and I think it's always hard when it's like the first race of the season as well like mm. everyone doesn't know where anyone's at you know you don't know how yeah. anyone's winter has gone and it was something I was really kind of I'd got myself mentally into a good place for it and I was really excited and you know I was going to go in number one and you know, there's. I don't know if I'm going to race Yokohama, so I probably won't wear the number one. You know, at at one point this year, I don't know when I'll wear it, but it was frustrating. And then, um, yeah, mm. I yeah, I'm just and I like that course as well, so I was kind of gutted that it was it was off. But anyway, on to the arena games in a couple of weeks. Mm. Well, I guess that's that that goes to the that other quality of resilience. Yeah, I think yeah, you have to. To, yeah as I say like I have to be resilient when I was teaching 18 year olds but you, you also have to be resilient in sport because it's hard you know you have to be able to pick yourself up after bad races and mm. um, yeah and just kind of move forwards and keep moving forwards so um, I think that's definitely a trait that again you have to work out like the patience you know mm. you know after Paris a lot of people are going to be Googling Beth Potter, people who maybe have never heard your name before, but they're going to want to know more about you after they see you race this coming summer. And if they find this interview, what do you want them to know about you? Um, I don't really know, to be honest. I, I feel like there's a lot of stuff out there already, but... um. <laughs> I am a really bad quitter. I'm mm. really bad. I'm really bad at quitting things. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think that's probably what. That's probably why I've been successful because I'm, um, not good at giving things up. You know, I I I just have to find a way and and also that um, yeah, like I've failed lots of times, but. Mm. that was I feel like you get more from the failures than from some of the good races or some of the good experiences because um learning how to fail just makes you better at succeeding sort of mm. thing so um I don't know yeah maybe those two things like I'm yeah resilient and quite tough and I think um that carries across like many kind of parts of my life as well mm. you just you just summed up my career right there I was I was a bad quitter. I, I I couldn't give up that that feeling like I know there's something better in there. I just have to figure out how to get it out. Yeah, and I, I like my parents just that's what they were like when I was growing up. You know, I couldn't even I couldn't I rallied with my mom from years to not go to saxophone practice on a Tuesday night at the the wind at the wind band because she wouldn't let me quit the wind band. And I was like, but I just want to do track, mom. I don't mm -hmm. want to go to the wind band, and she, you know. It, that was really hard for my mom to let us quit that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've quit some things in my life, but to pursue other things. So I think, yeah, it's definitely been kind of fed down through my parents. So, yeah. You've been practicing for years to not be a quitter. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> oh, at this point in, in your life, what are you most proud of? Just now? Um I feel like I'm 
pretty proud of the journey that I've been on to get here, you know, because it's not been smooth. It's not been straightforward for a number of, I don't know, a number of reasons. Like I didn't have the funding at some at one point and I didn't have, you know, the belief from sponsors and I, I couldn't get any sponsors. So I think, yeah, I guess that taps back into the whole resilience side of things. But um, I'm proud that I didn't give up. I'm proud that I kept going and I kept believing and I, um, you know, believed in myself and just felt like I wasn't done yet. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of sticking it out. Um, yeah, I think that's probably my biggest thing. You know, that was a, re- that was a really hard period of time, you know, mm. a couple of years ago where, you know, like I often just was in tears at the end of races thinking, what, what am I doing? Why, why am I doing this? And um, there was just a little glimmer of hope that I'd seen in training or, you know, at one race that just kind of kept me in there. And I'm glad that I... I'm glad that I stuck at it. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's the part of the sport that a lot of people don't see. They will see you. They saw, you know, we all saw you in Paris, top of the podium, the test event. We'll see you in the Olympics this coming summer. But people don't see those sort of unseen challenges that you've had to deal with to get yourself there. Yeah, it's it's not been straightforward. And, you know, there's only like a small handful of people that have, you know, been there for the whole journey, like my parents, my sister. Hmm. And, David you know like and yeah but they've they've seen the whole 360 you know they've seen the the tears after bad races they've seen the yeah just the wanting to wanting to give up or doubting myself or just thinking what's the point um and yeah I think yeah just just that like it's it's so good to now be where I'm at and I, I look back now and I just think, why was I even upset? Like, obviously I was going to get there. I was, I was going to mm-hmm. do it. Um, but yeah, I guess nothing certain. And um, I, I'm a lot, I'm a couple, you know, I'm eight years older than I was in Rio and hopefully got many more experiences under my belt and hopefully can deal with the highs or the disappointments better than I did last time. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, I think all that's left to really do is get a couple more months of training in and, <laughs> and get racing. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I really am. No, that's great. We're we're all looking forward to seeing you race in Paris. You are a, a true gift to the sport. Your journey is is completely inspiring. And hopefully anybody who's watched this will go, you know what? I was ready to quit, but after listening to Beth, I'm gonna keep going. I, I want to be good at not quitting. I want that to be my superpower. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and if in doubt, just chunk it into little sections. I always find that helps. Like just by if you see something that's too big, just break it into like little parts and just get through those little parts. That always helps me, especially on tough sessions or uh, yeah, tough workouts. <laughs> Great. Well, I I don't I I don't want to end this interview without having people know something about you that they probably don't know. And I just learned this just before we went on that you're a painter. Do you want to show us that one on the oh. wall? God. Yeah, okay um can you see that yeah yeah look at that i don't i don't really and the one next to it, this one here with the red one that's actually my my aunt in australia she did that she's got ms and she um she drew uh, that so that's also two bits of art in the house but yeah i like when in my spare time i like to kind of um get a bit artistic you know i like to do things so i did this a couple of years ago and um, actually for my sister but it's too big for her house, so she she doesn't have a big she doesn't have a wall that she can put it on. So she's given it back to me. So um, it's it's now in my new kind of uh, we've got we just had our house renovated, so it's just now in the kitchen. Um, but yeah, I like to do things to de stress, mm. um, and yeah, doing things like painting or something artistic, I quite I quite enjoy that. Well, there you go, Road to Paris, Beth Potter, athlete painter amazing oh, no. <laughs> um good good luck in paris this summer we're all going to be cheering for you and uh we know it's going to be an amazing day for you thank you so much thanks for having me all right cheers everybody cheers.